Okay, so this is uh, joint work with Yo Borma. It's very much in progress. We very much would appreciate any feedback. So the big question of the paper is how large are welfare gains from efficient tax reform? The starting point is gonna be uh, where I normally start, which is writing down a positive economy, uh, getting all fussy about matching things up to data. Uh, here we're gonna have the, uh, we're gonna actually have some beautiful administrative data. So it'll be a little bit more intense than what I'm used to. Um, but I'm gonna, uh, but we're, what we're gonna do today is instead of kind of working near the positive economy doing uh, small counterfactuals, we really wanna think about linking uh, the positive economy to the efficient frontier. And in particular, thinking about Pareto improving uh, policy reforms. And we'll compare, we'll use the answer that we get to kind of inform partial reforms. So uh, that's gonna sound all super vague. So what I decided to do, because I get 25 minutes, is to boil this all up into a picture. So um, I don't know if you can see, can they see the title? Yeah, okay. So it's gonna be an idea in a picture. So let me start with where we normally start, you know, kind of a Buley like oh wait, I met the women in macro, an Imra Horolu-like uh, OLG economy. And there's going to be incomplete markets, you know, heterogeneous households. They're all going to be making consumption labor savings decisions. Uh, you know, and then we'll look at, we'll choose parameters and policies to match up to the economy we have in our mind. Uh, and then from that, I can compute remaining lifetime uh, utilities. I can judge how well different households are doing. And there's some, a J to index the household. Um, and you know, if I have administrative data, I have millions and millions of Js. Let me draw this. Imagine I had two households because I'm really bad at drawing millions and millions of guys. So I'm gonna draw two. And it would look something like this. The value, and here again, remaining lifetime value for household A and household B, and there'd be some dot. Well, sorry, right. Ellen, but um, so when you say positive economy, are you assuming that there is some form of tax system in, in place yep. or that there is? Yep. yep, there's taxes, everything. We're going to go, we're going to go look up marginal tax rates and all that. Perfect. So it's really kind of where we normally, where the quantitative macro guys are usually looking. Okay, then typically, We'll um, think about, you know, this is going to be, you know, the typical exercise would be there'd be some constraints on policy instruments, constraints imposed because there are legal constraints, political constraints, and so on. And we do counterfactuals and we might look at optimum within a restricted class. Let me draw that in the picture. So that in the picture would be, uh, you know, kind of little deviations. Um, around, we're, we're going to look at perturbations and, you know, like my work with, you know, when I work with Rao or Ed, we're kind of looking around some point. But that's a very frustrating way to proceed. So with Yob, I said, okay, it's time to get serious and think about linking this up to what the people like. Now, again, this is women in macro. Stancheva would be doing. Those guys um, would not necessarily start with that dot. They're typically going to be in the Murley's uh, tradition. They'll be thinking about constraints on information sets and they'll characterize efficient allocations and discuss and characterize or prove theorems about wedges in those models. I wanna draw that in the picture. So that in the picture, will be this blue line, the efficient frontier, okay? We're gonna compute that too. But what we wanna do is we want to compute the full Pareto improving, so that'll be a segment of that frontier, a la Merlis. We wanna think about Pareto improving reforms a la Ramsey, and we want to use the Burleys to kind of get ideas, inform those little black arrows that I was talking about before. So let me try that in the picture. 
Okay, so here's what I had before. Here we are, happy as can be with our little economy, thinking about perturbations. But we have no idea when we're down here how far away we are from the efficient frontier. And so what we're trying to do in this project is a link up. And in particular, what I'm most interested in is not necessarily going that way, but going that way, especially because ultimately we will bring in people like Marina who will be thinking about the political economy. And so we're really interested in constructing Pareto improving and then linking them. Okay, now, so this is gonna be what we do at the step one. And then we wanna think about once we've seen that and once we've looked at the world here, we've looked at all the little particles in that world and we've compared them all the particles in this world. What we wanna do is say, well, how close could we get within the class that, you know, is, that is in the economy, within the class of, you know, policies that are, you know, say politically feasible because they're already in place. So that's, that's the goal. It's three steps, black dot, red dot, green dot. That sounds like I'm a kindergarten teacher. Black dot, red dot, green dot. But that's gonna be the black dot, red dot, green dot is gonna come out through the top. As you can see. <laughs> okay, so what we're trying to do, we're gonna solve equilibria so solve equilibria for the positive economy. That's like use all the tools for the Buley, Ayagari, Imrohorolu, Huggett, you know, economies that we're used to writing down. The inputs there, it, important inputs are gonna be the fiscal policies that are in place in those countries to answer Veronica's question. And what wage, you know, what, pro, what shocks hit these guys? That's gonna be, obviously critical if you're thinking about taxation and redistribution. We're gonna take the outputs, we're gonna take those V's that were in my picture, those, and I want you to imagine there's not two V's, there's, you have how many households in Netherlands? There's eight million V's, okay? Line them up. Those would be, obviously we're not gonna really do eight million, we're gonna have groups but it sounds very dramatic if you have like 8 million, um, but there'll be groups. Those will be the inputs to dealing with finding the Pareto frontier, because we're gonna say to the planner, you have to do as well as what they got right now. And by the way, it could be, today what I'm gonna be talking about is, is doing that calculation for future cohorts but right now we didn't get it done, unfortunately, but we're working on existing cohorts and future cohorts. So all people, moving all people to a Pareto uh, improving state. Then the outputs are gonna be the normal outputs you get from the Merleys exercise, which will be these wedges and the welfare games. So, but we wanna say, okay, what's the distance between that black dot and that red dot? Like, you know, when Ed and Rao and I were doing our papers, how far away were we? But that's not, we're not satisfied with sitting there. What we want to do is really use the answer to really help, because you can't implement this. I mean, this, this is some super complicated, history dependent, you know, wildly complex thing. But, but we could come back to our black dot and ask, well, how far can we get? Okay, so that's the, that's the program. Today, I'm gonna to show you that uh, to get to that red dot from, we're gonna, we're gonna be parameterizing using administrative data for the Netherlands, 21% between the black dot and the red dot. We're right now, okay, this is work in progress. We're looking at doing the green arrow. Uh, I'm gonna uh, confess that these are not 
uh, final numbers. This is, we're still hill climbing because we're looking over a very complex set of, you know, we've got piecewise linear tax functions and, you know, as, as anybody who's ever done hill climbing over a large space, you've always got your uh, fingers crossed. I'm gonna decompose, um, I'm gonna show you under the hood of the black dot and red dot so you can see kind of how we can possibly inform ourselves about making progress on, you know, doing Ramsey optimal. And I, I, again, like I said earlier, we're, we, right now I'm showing you numbers for, imagine we were uh, just computing the gains for the future cohorts. And I'm, and I'm assuming, you know, just uh, the same consumption equivalent gains for all of them. Uh, we're working on doing it for all cohorts, including existing cohorts. Okay, contributions to the literature. So there's 8 billion papers um, doing the theory and application, you know, doing those little black arrows. Um, where we're going to, you know, go beyond that would be to um, use some of this administrative data, which helps us, and I'll show you how. Um, there is another paper, the closest paper to us was written by um, Ruzbe Husseini and Ali Sharide. They have fixed, fixed types. Um, we're able to do this by doing the kind of full-blown Merleys. So um, we're, we're really extending to allow for dynamic risks. And then there's a lot of theory on the Merleys, you know, thinking about um, characterizing the wedges. And we're going to basically be tapping it. They've got a, some of their theorems are very helpful for us when we go to do our quantitative stuff. Because we're quantitative guys, we are going to have to extend what they've done. So, for example, they typically use very specific um, processes for the income uh, shocks. We're going to extend what they've done uh, because we need to bring it back to the quantitative stuff. So, there's going to be some innovation there, but the biggest difference is the linking of the OLG to the planner, then doing full GE, not just a, a household problem, but we want to add everything up. So for us, everything is about kind of comparing the full general equilibrium at the black dot, the red dot, the green dot. And then, sorry, clarification quickly. Dynamic risk, you're thinking about individual specific time persistent or, and or yeah. aggregate? That's a great question because I'm about to show it right now. So... In answer to her question, this will be an open OLG economy, a la Bulli. I should have put Imra Horolu. Okay, so with the heterogeneous age, we're gonna have Elena, we're gonna have uh, uh, here, there's gonna be people of different uh, um, education. That'll be a persistent type. We're gonna have productivity shocks. These will be privately observed and stochastic, i.e., you know, unless you live in you know, have the East German Stasis in your basement, they won't be able to condition on, you know, epsilon to the T. We're introducing unemployment and marriage um, shocks because what we want to show is that you could have also kind of low frequency shocks, which are kind of critical. Uh, when, when people are studying the OLG models, they have these kind of low frequency things. Um, right now, in what I'm showing you today, marriage is stuck on your head or not but we want to have a marriage market and divorce um, so that you can get rid of, you know, this is women in macro red. So you can get rid of the guys. Uh, but uh, right now this is still in progress. It's still in notes. And then we'll have, you know, the transfers and, and taxes a la Netherlands. And, and we'll estimate it. Um, we'll, we'll estimate the whole thing using our microdata. But the key thing, Elena, the key thing is going to be you know, parameterizing this. Absolutely. Okay. Now here's red dot. So we're taking the inputs and this is important. We have to now, you know, condition on uh, getting as well, you know, doing as well in your OLG economy as you will, you know, in the planning economy. So for those of you who normally think about, you know, doing the social welfare function, you know, you uh, maximize the utilitarian. Uh -uh. That's not this, okay? And that's gonna be important. That's not this, because we're taking as given 
these values from the black dot. Okay. Efficiency, it's Pareto efficiency. I won't linger on this. All of you, uh, I'm sure, get what that means. But one thing I will say is that 21% was assuming we gave all agents in the future cohorts uh, 21%. So we gave them equal uh, consumption gains. Later, when we go to bring in all existing people, we want to think about, you know, like, we're going to be looking at like 80 year olds who have one year left and things like that. So it, it, it may not make sense to do, I bet eight. It may not make sense to give everybody the same equivalent, equivalent game, but we would like to understand who's made, you know, like how much better off are people? Like how tight is that constraint on their OLG, uh, making their old, them as well off as in the OLG? Okay, so here we are. I'm back to uh, doing this. How would we construct it? For those who want to see the gory map, I uploaded some slides on, on the homepage of my webpage. It says updated slides. You can look at the map appendix. Right now, I'm just going to say it in words. You would maximize the present value of aggregate resources subject to all incentive constraints. So like any Merlis, there are private, you know, there's, you can't, you're, you don't have the East German Stasi, so you can't condition on that. And here, this is critical, that we give you at least as what good as what you get in the OLG. And importantly, that we're gonna do the whole OLG, uh, the whole uh, GE, so that the, the total resources, we're not spending more here than we would in the OLG. Okay, that sounds hard. And that's why I never even tried this before. But there's a lot of stuff that's gone on before we got started that helps us solve this problem. Not, it's not that bad. OK, I do have a large cluster, and we put it on a lot of parallel uh, things. But if you had a cluster, it's not that bad. So we're going to exploit the separability to solve household by household. And then we can add them up. But, but we can do one at a time. We're going to use the fact that we, we can uh, only enforce some of the incentive constraints. And then we check afterward that they all hold. So that's the verify numerically. And we're going to, everything can be done recursively. So you're not solving some massive thing. You're solving a recursive dynamic program. You have to keep track of the, the, the promise value for telling the truth and the threat values. But you know, it's not that hard. Okay, what are the deliverables? We're gonna give you welfare gains and then we're gonna decompose it. Uh, and then you get some wedges. I won't uh, spend much time on this um, and I'm not gonna spend where, there's a lot of stuff we do I won't talk about for looking at the sensitivity. Like I said, we use uh, administrative data for the uh, Netherlands. We get, importantly, we get details on earnings and hours, which we don't get, or we get shitty stuff in the US. Uh, and we have a lot of information about their education. Of course, we do the national accounts. This is macro after all. And we've got all the stuff for the tax schedules. The big advantage is gonna be computing the shocks. Uh, so we can construct the hourly wages. We can classify people by their education type. We can bin them. We have six groups. Like I said, there's going to be a stamp on your head that you're in a particular kind of household, like high, high, you know, high education, high education. And we'll group the singles that you're you and a roommate. And then we estimate AR processes. Here's what the wage profiles look like. And, and you'll have to see the paper for the estimated. I'm not gonna linger on this because I have probably only five minutes left. Uh, but there's big differences. Exactly, five, the, exactly five right now. <laughs> okay, most of the people are actually on this purple line. Okay, one aside. People often say, wow, you know, you have this beautiful data from the Netherlands. Why don't you just condition on everything? Well, you, you, you can ex post see things. You can't ex ante think see things. 
So it's not that the government can go, again, they're not the, they're not the Stasi. So what we're trying to do is um, think about truthful reporting of types. Okay. There's other key parameters. I'm not gonna go into it right now because I don't have time. I wanna save time for the results. So something that uh, people oftentimes uh, stress are the labor wedges, which gives some idea of how distorted the margins are in the Murleys. I'm not, I mean, I could spend some time explaining exactly why it looks like this, but all I wanna do right now is say, look at these, look at the Y axis, okay? These numbers are on the order of four to 20. The Netherlands tax rates are on the order of 40 plus. Okay, so there's a big difference. So it's not gonna to be too, too surprising that we're gonna get some gains. In fact, we get the gains of 21% because you know, you've got big taxes in, and then I do wanna say tax rates versus tax wedges, they're not the same thing. Okay, what if we compared the OLG economy? One thing I like about this is we can compare, you know, the consumption levels and the, um, leisure levels for the same people. And that actually helps me a lot because it helps me think about like possible uh, reforms. So if we looked at the very lowest group, the, which has got the bulk of the people, so the low education uh, uh, a wife and husband, we can compare the planner result with the positive economy result and I'll focus on just a couple of things. You can see, look at the big gain. The big gains uh, from the planner obviously smooths out the consumption, no surprise there. And OLG levels, you know, you've got, you've got some you know, rise over the life cycle. We're getting a lot of gains just in the level of consumption. In fact, that's where most of our gains come. There are some some gains due to different kinds of smoothing, but that's not, the action is here. So if I'm thinking about, you know, how do I push towards, how do I go back to the, the Netherlands policies? You know, what we wanted to think about was how far could we get within their class and, and what kind of things could be added that could give you a big boost? So we've been thinking about um, uh, adding things that help early in life, that help get you more consumption, level of consumption early in life. Why are we giving social security to old poops and not those same uh, transfers to the young? Now, okay, I did say that I'm not all the way done with my hill climbing, but we're getting a delta uh, in gains of about two percentage point from a very simple uh, additional, um, additional uh, reform that they don't have in the Netherlands. Okay. All right, I'm gonna summarize so that uh, Veronica doesn't have to get out the hook. The whole um, goal here is to really get into the numbers uh, and to try to understand the sources of the gains, you know, it, it kind of leaves me flat when somebody says, here's my, you know, I got this number at the end and, and you don't know where it's coming from. We want ideas for uh, policy, you know, are there new and not that hard to, to, to introduce policy instruments that give us big bang, that would be nice. Also, one thing we'd like to, to do is like set up our programs and set up this, you know, the notes and all the things that go with it. So people could use this as a prototype. I think there's a lot of distance between uh, the black dot people and the red dot people. Um, and we're trying to say, you know, we could, we could come together. So uh, I look forward to uh, Marina's comments and any others that uh, anyone might have. So this was a very nice paper um, by Ellen and George. Um, let me just quickly summarize a little bit what they are doing in case there were some doubts. So they start doing kind of a positive analysis in the sense that they start from a real life 
super duper macro calibrated economy with all the bells and whistles. So they have an OSG model with life cycle profiles, idiosyncratic productivity shocks, and they really try to replicate all the tax policies, tax breaks, instruments that the Netherlands has. Now in terms of, it always helps me think about what frictions are behind this positive analysis uh, that they do. And there are three types of frictions they will have. So on the one hand, they are going to have incomplete asset markets. So this is in the, in the spirit of, you know, uh, Ayagadi type models. Um, they are going to have incomplete tax instruments. What I mean here is that they, do, they are going to assume from the start that there's no uh, individual specific non-distortionary instruments for the planner. And maybe a rationale of why that happens is that the planner cannot see uh, labor productivity or those idiosyncratic and insurable risks. So because of the combination of incomplete tax instruments and incomplete asset markets, the planner cannot take us to a first best. So if we think of a very easy world like they were doing, where two individuals, where what we measure is the lifetime utility of a generation born, you know, at some period that lives for J years, and we look at how happy the two types of individuals in the Netherlands are, we get this blue dot. I have different colors than Ellen, but this is kind of like their replica of a real world economy. Now, because of all those frictions, we know that this is going to be inefficient. And this is a typical starting point from any macro finance model. So what do people in the macro public finance approach typically do? And she discussed this a little bit. We ask ourselves, can we have can we find a better combination of fiscal policies by tweaking a realistic tax system? So we say, oh, what if we give transfers for the lowest 1%? What if we use cash transfer? What if we do subsidies? What if we change the progressivity? So when we do this type of analysis, and I say we because I've done it too, we are kind of shooting in the dark because we are first thinking about, you know, there is a, a system which has uh, capital and labor taxes. And now we say, well, let's get rid of capital taxes because they must be bad. And let's put BAT consumption taxes. Now that's something that can make everybody better off or maybe it makes some guys better off and some guys worse off. Um, so all these reforms that we typically do in traditional macro public finance approach are not necessarily Pareto improvement. And as Ellen mentioned, this brings a lot of political economy considerations, you know, who wins, who loses, who would support the, the, the reform. Now, the reforms are somewhat arbitrary, but they are always realistic. So they start from a very real tax system and they try to think of combinations of taxes and transfer that we see in other countries. You know, we, you decrease one, increase the other and see what happens. Now, what does the new dynamic public finance approach? And I think she called this the blue dots. So they go totally different and they say, okay, forget about the real world in the following sense. Let's think of what is the best we can achieve in an economy where we give the planner every possible tax instrument. So I'm not going to Ramsey force you to use distortionary linear taxes. I let you put any wages, um, wages you want. So in principle, you could insure people, but I'm going to keep one friction, which is I do not know your tax. So how do this part of the literature think of optimal policy? Well, the thing is, what is the best we can do given the constraint that we don't observe the individual type? And when they characterize this, they think of allocations, not necessarily about how to implement this, but they think of all the possible allocations we can achieve. And this is what we have here in the red line. And it's going to be constraint efficient because we still have a friction we cannot get rid of. Of course, this is going to be better than just some, or potentially better than that's just um, uh, something inside the frontier. But again, um, first, it's a little bit utopic because here we are thinking, imagine we could design under the veil of ignorance from scratch, a tax transfer system with a private, inf private information friction. Now, what we typically want to think about is, you know, if this is real life, can we get better? So one problem that sometimes, and this is I think why uh, Ellen was saying that these literatures don't talk a lot to each other, is that 
you know, first, we don't know, we don't know how to go for, from one point to the other. Second, there are too many points in this constraint frontier. Third, not all the points are going to be Pareto improving, given that we start from some initial point. So we are here today. And then, yeah, these are all possible optimal constraint efficient uh, points we could achieve, but you know, do we even want to go there if we ask uh, individuals? So what do they do? So they compute that const uh, constraint efficient Pareto allocation uh, frontier using the new dynamic public finance approach. So this is kind of an Ayagari, Magrata, Nimohoroglus meets mirrorless. And by the way, this is very non-trivial and it has not been done before to the extent they are doing it because they have a really complete you know, macro model with idiosyncratic shocks, capital, and policies. And then they try to compute like the GE of an overlapping generation economy. This is non-trivial at all. This is economy, you know, that you start from capital, then you converge to another stationary equilibrium, etc. And then what do they do? They say, okay, you know, we are here in the blue dot. We know where we could be going. Now let me search for uh, allocations that can take us to the Pareto frontier along a 45 degree line. And what this means is we make sure everybody's going to have a Pareto gain. So this by definition is going to be Pareto improving by construction because a constraint in their problem is that you need to at least give people as much happiness as they did. And if they do it in the 45 degree line, you're giving everybody the same amount of extra happiness. So this is going to be better. This is going to take us to a specific point. And uh, this is going to be um, very uh, informative for policymakers. Now, what I think is the biggest contribution of this paper, that they are bridging the gap between what people in the macro public finance approach do, which think of reforms, and what people in the new dynamic public finance approach do, which is they think of what's the best we can do given constraints. So for all of us think that like public finance, this is a big technological improvement because they are bridging these two literatures. They're showing that the literatures can work with each other. And at least to me, this opens a whole new quantitative research agenda because now we can think not only of very utopic worlds and not only very narrow reforms, we can really think of big picture reforms that are sensible and that they are going to be policy relevant. And I think that's a big, big contribution of this paper, uh, that this paper has. Now I'm going to give you some comments. Uh, I have like two minutes left. So the first thing is, so the, their starting point is they're thinking, this is a difficult problem, right? You have to, there are long transitions. So the way they do it is they think, okay, let's think of Netherlands as a country that is in the stationary distribution and what they call B, which is the lifetime utility of a person that was born in period J, is basically you take a policy, which is Netherlands in the real life example, and you evaluate that policy in the utility of individuals. And I put an expectation sign there. So it's like we will wake up in the stationary distribution, how happy people born today are going to be through their lifetime. So this is the departing point. Then they say, okay, we can do along the 45 degree line a reform that is going to bring us to the Pareto frontier, and that's a new policy sequence. Let's call it X star. Now, the way they evaluate the reform is they think of the happiness of a generation that instead of being born in the Netherlands today, is born in a country in the new steady state, given the new policy. So in some sense, it's, it's again, a, a normative a la Conesa Kito Kruger experiment, where they are thinking of a generation that will be born in the steady state of the reform economy. And they are comparing these two things. So of course, the big question is, how do we get there? Um, and and uh, somebody says, okay. So the big question is, how do we go? Because we are thinking about reforms today to what they identify as something better. Really? And there are very, a, a bunch of things that are important here. The first thing is, what about the transition? So any policy change you make, as anybody that has worked with reform knows, will involve, for example, changing distortions on capital and maybe you know consume less and, and, and invest more. That's going to be very painful for all the guys that are in between. And they are not being considered in this analysis. And, and Ellen acknowledged this, but I just want to make clear exactly 
what is what needs to be done. So all the transition is going to be important. And, you know, who knows what happens once we take into account. This also brings us to the point of... You, you need to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like three more, two more points. How do we think of all the generations in between? You know, is there discounting? Do we care more about the guys here because they need to vote for the reform? Do we have some discounting? Because now we give all the weight to these guys uh, in steady state. Uh, and then the third point is, see, I have my own, which policies would take us there? So one thing that the big elephant in the room in all this literature is how do you decentralize? If you want to make it policy relevant, you need to think about which actual policies, we just characterize allocations here, are going to bring us there. And the last three points I have are on the calibration. I just leave them here and I'll open up for other questions. They are like smaller points, but these are my three big comments to the paper. Yes, Can Valerie? I just say one thing while we're waiting for questions? Um, we are, in fact, do it working on the transition as we speak. Great. So Valerie has a question. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the paper carefully, but I did skim it over while you were talking. And I noticed that you assume it's a small open economy. Mm -hmm. And so the interest rate is constant. So it's not really DGE. And and I also noticed, I was wondering about two issues. First of all, do you just assume no trade, no capital flows, it looks like. And then also, um, you don't have the external debt elastic uh, interest rate, which, you know, uh, Stephanie schmidt Grody has shown in rec uh, you know, previous research that you really need to get stationarity of the economy. And I was wondering how you dealt with that. Yeah, so first, um, even if it were U.S., I probably would uh, do it the way we did it. We had a long discussion. Yob and I, who's sitting on the other side of this room, since we have to social distance here, um, we've been talking about that as a sensitivity check of closing. But since you know, even the U.S., there's capital flows. That, you know, a lot of capital flows in and out. I want to think that there that what we would face, what they, the country would face, is a sequence. You know, when we're on the transition, there would be a sequence of world interest rates. Um, but I don't think of the Netherlands and the U.S. differently on that because the capital flows are still huge for both. And we do have, because it is the Netherlands, we are taking into account, and probably it's not well written in the draft that's up online, it, we do have the foreign sector, since they do have a foreign sector. But uh, yeah, no, uh, we, we, we are, it would be our sensitivity check to close the economy, not our vision of what the benchmark is. Hi, uh, this is a great paper and it's a very uh, understated with a with the picture. Um, but this is um, I have a question related to um, uh, the taxation. You said that you have a linear piecewise schedule, and I'm wondering how you fit how you how you calibrate that. Is it is the linear piecewise schedule on marginal ta on effective marginal tax rates, and then no, I'm gonna let some you transfer to get negative? Yeah. I mean, I can take it, but. Yo, why don't you, because he constructed the... Sorry, sorry. Um, so this is the other side of the room. Uh, so the way we parameterized it was by literally looking at the Dutch tax code. And we just took the statutory tax rates for each of the income brackets. And we did this both for the uh, income tax schedule on labor and the income tax schedule on assets. It, and does that, that account for, say, like a, a negative average tax rate with like like in this country, like an EITC, like a refundable tax credit or something like that, can you account, can you account for that? Uh, that could be put in. Uh, here, the focus has mainly been on, on households that work. Uh, that's how the model has been calibrated and estimated. Uh, but we also have like lump sum components in addition. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so like we have a two a more, we have two more questions. Uh, um, one from uh, uh, Stephanie and one from Elena. Stephanie, go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Super interesting paper. Uh, very fascinating to think about merging these two approaches. Apart from feasibility, you know, understand the political economy feasibility makes you want to look at uh, Pareto improvements, uh -huh. but can you just apply this to actually other changes too? Actually having like a weighted yes. objective? Yes, yes, yes. We, we could. I mean, we focused on that just because maybe I'm maybe I'm too obsessed with um, 
the ultimate goal of, of getting the getting the political economist interested. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no, we could do anything on whatever was my blue, exactly. uh, blue. Uh, and, you know, obviously when, when I've done stuff in the past, I, it's very unlikely that I was, you know, the stuff that I did with Rao and uh, the, I don't think we, we probably didn't have, we weren't looking at Pareto improvements. Mm -hmm. We were just using some um, kind of the typical, you utilitarian welfare function. Yeah, just because Pareto improvements may be too hard to reach from some settings, right? Agreed. And, yeah. Yeah. And so this is going to come up, Stephanie, I think, when we are bringing in not just the, the future people, and, mm -hmm. you're, and you're really trying to transit from the existing, uh, you know, you say, okay, we're going to take into account all the 80-year-olds in the Netherlands, all the 70-year-olds, and so on. It, it, it's absolutely a bear because I've tried it in uh, in uh, in another context. It's a bear to, to get everybody happy. Yeah, or, makes sense. I, I totally agree. Good. What's super hey. nice? Thank you. We are really out of time. Elena, can you ask super quick your question and, yes, uh, and Elena I sure. answer super quick? I will. And I I wasn't sure about what are the feasible instruments that you allow for in moving halfway towards the frontier and relatedly whether I should think about, we should think about this framework along your business cycle accounting work as a fiscal accounting uh, set up to be used uh, uh, in very many ways. Yeah, great question. Um, here, the, when we're hill climbing right now, all we have um, relaxed are the tax functions for labor, assets, um, consumption. Uh, and then I played with these early life transfers. Oh, and retirement, you know, like Social Security. Those were the instruments being uh, hill climbed. 